Episode 47. I'm the kind of person that says don't plan your life. Really? Of course not. That's but very crazy. You plan, you plan to fail. Nah, that's rubbish. Yeah. That's rubbish. Why? Why? Welcome to the Muslim Life Hackers Podcast. The weekly podcast providing you with tips and tricks on how to hack your life and maximize its potential. And now for your hosts, Mifra Maroof and Maheen Malik. As we sail across the sea of life, so much... Assalamu alaikum. This is Maheen Malik here with episode 47 of the podcast. In today's show, we actually have a guest interview with Hamza Zorsas. Hamza is an international speaker on Islam, a writer, a lecturer, an instructor, and a researcher. He delivers courses and workshops worldwide with organizations such as IERA, Alcolta Institute, and the International Online University. In today's episode, Mifra and I will be having a conversation with Hamza on topics like how to plan for the future, critical thinking, and how to tackle the problems that you're facing today, along with much, much more. And as usual, you can find all the links and resources mentioned in today's episode in our show notes at muslimlifehackers.com forward slash 47. And that's the number 47. So with that being said, let's get straight into the interview. All right, Hamza, thank you so much for joining us for this interview. We're really excited and hopefully we can get into the guts of this interview. Yeah, so one of the things that we want to start off this interview that we know that you went Hajj recently. And so, you know, with every, every single person that goes to Hajj, they come back with like a different experience that's unique to them. So we're interested to know, like, what were your experiences from your Hajj trip that you can share with our audience? It's a very good question. <clears throat> Hajj for me was what I call the de-individualization of the self Oh, I'm not supposed to use big words like that, am I? Basically. <laughs> Go ahead. But yeah, basically, I became nothing. Yeah. And in the midst of three million people, in that nothing, you actually, actually find yourself. Mm. Because you strip away your kind of false identity and the illusions that you've built around your life, like, I am this, I am that, and so forth. So that was stripped away from me, and then I basically became nothing and through that nothingness I found that I'm just an abid, I'm just a worshipper of Allah, a worshipper of Allah. And during Hajj what you experience is actually a true sense of happiness without sounding spiritual cliche, without it sounding like a cliche. And the reason I'm saying it's true happiness because nothing else matters apart from going to Mina, praying, reading Qur'an, going to Arafah, going to Muzdalifah, going back to Mina, doing the Jamarat, etc, etc. And you're like following a process. You're just following the command of Allah and the will of Allah. Just like the planets, they are in so orbit cool. mm-hmm. and everything obeys a certain law and they have a certain function. And so you've basically stripped away all of the Illusory, illusory aspects of your life, like your ego, who am I? I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a teacher, I'm this, I'm, I'm that. It's all irrelevant. And you become nothing, and in that nothingness, you find who you are, which is you just the worship of Allah, and you, you become really happy. Mm. And when you come back, you get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have that like uh, withdrawal sy- symptoms. So this is kind of like what you've been talking about recently in your talks and courses about awakening the fitra. Maybe. Mm. That's a good link. Mm. But what we talk about in concerning awakening the fitra, we talk about that there is something within us that Allah has created according to the traditions in Sahih Muslim and other places. And in the Quran itself, where Allah has created something that is natural and unchanging, that acknowledges Allah and wants to worship Him. So this is what you call the fitra. Other ulama, like Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, even Taimi and others, they said not only is it the natural disposition to worship Allah and to acknowledge Him, but also that we're molded to be in line with the Islamic ethics and the Islamic tradition, Islam. So that's the fitrah. And the way to wake up the fitrah is essentially doing things like going to Hajj. Mm. I'm not saying Hajj is a calamity because in the Quran, you see that there are various ways of of waking up or triggering the 
the fitra to awaken. And those are to ponder, to reflect, to reflect on the Qur'an, to engage with Islam in that manner, but also to experience calamities and problems and hardship. And hajj is a hardship. Mm. So that is like a window of opportunity, a spiritual window of opportunity for you to open and for you to reach Allah and come close to Allah. And at the same time, it awakens who you are. So when I went to Hajj, and many other people have experienced this, you just realize that you're nothing but that nature. Mm. So you strip away all your illusory identities and your ego, and then all you have left is nothing with your fitra. Yeah. And it's saying, hey, I want to worship Allah. You just there to do like your job kind yes. of thing. Mm. So this is really interesting. But it's more profound than that. It's more profound than and that. And the reason it's more profound than that is because it's like when Allah says, those who forget, forgot Allah, Allah will make them forget their own selves. Mm. So in a way, our self-identity is contingent, dependent on remembering Allah. Mm. Mm. So it's that when you remember Allah, and when you find Allah SWT in your life, you'll find yourself. Yes, exactly. Pretty much. Mm. Exactly. Mm, that's really interesting. So uh, h- how do we connect this with... Uh, today in our societies, we're told that we know we're like we're special snowflakes. We're like all like special butterflies, and we're all individuals, and we all have like we have to go after like what we want to do in life and things like that. How do we consolidate consolidate this with the fact that you know we're slaves of Allah? We're, we're like you said, we're like nothing. Yes. Well, we live in a society that celebrates the ego. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you're this, you're that. Make a change. Be something. Uh, that's frankly all rubbish. Mm. Um, and the reason it's rubbish is because you're just you're just adding illusion upon illusion. You're just building upon your ego. So in Islam, you don't add; you take away. <laughs> That's what you do. So you strip away from the socialization, from the system that has affected who you are, whether it's materialism or whatever the case may be. And then that's when you find yourself. So things like salah, things like dhikr, things like reading the Quran. Like he doesn't really add to your identity. It removes the ego. So, salah, when you're in sajda, your heart is higher than your brain. You know, your, your, your face is on the floor in the dust. So your ego is being diminished. And essentially, you just find out who you are, which is, I'm just a simple person, mm. just worshipping Allah. Mm. So if you really, um, so with that in mind, like a person says, okay, they're a simple person and, um, you know, they know their place. But then how, with that mindset, how can they actually realize that they have something special to offer to this world? Um, how can you find the balance to that? Because sometimes a person can think so low of themselves that they feel like, you know, what use can I, you know, what change can I make? And, you know, I can't do anything because I'm nothing well, kind of thing. Well, they can't do any change. Yeah. Because Allah makes the change. So, yeah. you see, through that nothingness, if you like, through diminishing the ego, it doesn't mean you don't have a sense of self-esteem or you don't have honor. That doesn't mean that because our honor is in that debasement because when you humble yourself and you diminish your ego, then Allah elevates you. That's the point. Mm. It's not like, oh, I'm just nothing. I'm pointless. No, because Allah gives you value when you reach that position or stage. So, and through that, then you realize some of the goals that you want to achieve in your life because now you're connected to Allah and now it's about worship because there's a problem amongst the ummah we all want to be legacy builders and we're pioneers I want to do this and I want to, I want to do that there's so many leadership courses right which is, which is a gross injustice because seeking leadership is actually a spiritual disease in Islam oh I want to lead, I want to do this I want to change the world I want to be Islam or man yeah? <laughs> but at the end of the day this is all false and we must only do those things as a result of seeking the pleasure of Allah. And there's a fine balance here. And I think we missed that out in our popular culture. You know, we go to courses, we go to events. It's all about building that ego, you know. Um, but, you know, the Sahaba actually were so successful is because they were so humble and so connected to Allah. And it's through that they became successful. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we'll become successful through the ego. Now, yeah, so that's my view. So what is it that um, we have within us as individuals that make us so susceptible to, like, ego building? 
What is it that we need to like recognize within us? That we're nothing. That Allah is everything. Allah, everything you do is because of Allah. Mm. That's it. If you know that, and you know that you essentially are weak in terms of like, you know, you have a, you sin, for instance, you transgress, you're almost an enemy to your own soul. And the only thing that can change that is by connecting to Allah. Mm. So, if you realize you're nothing, Allah deserves all praise, all thanks, all gratitude. And you realize that you're not self-sufficient, because in Western societies, the biggest disease is that we think we're self-sufficient, because we get a job, we have Medicare, or whatever you call it, <laughs> you have medical insurance, you have this, you have that, you feel like you're almost godly, yeah. you're self-sufficient. Yeah. And that creates an ego, and that's a barrier to Allah. Because, you know, shaitan was misguided because of his ego, not because of his disbelief. I mean, from an aql perspective, he, he, he spoke to Allah. Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to do this because he had ego. You know, he was like, hey, I'm in a fire, he's in a clay. Yeah. What's going on here? Mm, something wrong. Mm. So... Yeah, so we think we're self-sufficient, and in this society it builds that. And we forget that we're actually very vulnerable, and that everything is dependent on Allah. And that's the critical point, because we're so busy with Facebook, Twitter, mobile phones, internet, forums, cooking, more cooking, <laughs> finding clothes, whatever the case may be, shopping, and we don't have time to realize who we are. And it's only certain things in life that wake up, wake us up sometimes, like the internet's down, or she left me, or <laughs> what do I do? whatever the case may be. And then we find that we're actually vulnerable, we're dependent. But then after we get back into that drunkard state yeah. of the rat race, it's me, and I'm self-sufficient, and yeah. I am the master of my destiny, you know? So, you know, following on that point that you said about how we're, we're living in like an ego society, it actually rem reminds me of that verse in the Quran in which it's like, have they taken gods as themselves? So pretty much that seems to be happening as in that, you know, you're saying each person is, feels like they're a godly individual. So with that, and then with realizing that you are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what would actually um, encourage a person to take action then if if they say that, okay, I'm dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do whatever change that's needed. Yeah, Where does my action it, come it, in? Yeah, because, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Take, take a dog, for example, right? And I like comparing humans to dogs because I think dogs in some form are quite more elevated than humans because dogs are far more, <laughs> they're far more loyal, for one. And um, at least dogs... I align with the nature, but many human beings don't align with our own natures. Mm, yeah. Take a dog, right? And it's based on a story from uh, one of the writers. I think his name was um, Gay Eaton. A very nice story. And basically, he's saying that him and his dog were in a very hot day, and they were walking in the forest or the jungle, whatever the case may be. And the dog was so, like, almost ill and tired, and he's tongue coming out and the man in the story was very tired and he wanted to find some shade so they stopped in some shade and the dog was like so, so pleased but then his master the owner deliberately walked off and the dog obediently just followed him still although mm -hmm. the dog wanted to rest and one needed that shade and he, he the owner ran back to the shade so the dog could get some shade and the dog was like almost like in a static pleasure. Now, the story that he got from this is, look look what the dog does for his owner. Mm. He would even basically, his fidelity, his obedience, his realization that his existence is dependent on the owner. Mm. Even though the dog could have stayed in the shade, but he, he obeys willingly. Mm, he put his needs. Regardless of a thousand sufferings. And then, in the story... The man basically says, I just realized, my lords, forgive me. Help me be like this lowly animal I contemptuously call a dog. Mm. But he's almost better than me because I am more I am more dependent upon Allah than a dog is dependent on me. Mm. And yet I don't act like the dog does. 
Do you see? Yeah. It is profound. So when you understand true dependency, then you do everything your master says. That's where the action comes. It's really interesting because um, oftentimes, like in life, we always do things that we know we shouldn't do. They're not good for us, but yet we proceed and we go ahead and we do them. And somehow we push back the the knowledge that, you know, this is bad, this is wrong. And we just go ahead and follow, like, you know, whimsical desires and things like that. It's really interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, just shaking things up a bit. Uh, and uh, connecting back with what you said, how we awaken at times in our life. Um, going back to your history, is there any moments within your life where you can say that, you know, you had that awakening moment and you realise that, you know, I'm really nothing, you know, I, I am dependent on Allah? Yeah, there's a few. Hmm. Um, I remember before I was Muslim, I had a friend who was Muslim and I remember it was in my mum's living room and he would say, we do things for the sake of God. Okay. I felt sick. Actually, I felt, I, literally inside me, my soul felt sick. I ran to the toilet and I was like, oh my God, I just felt really bad. Like, it was like one of those moments where your ego gets a bashing because I just couldn't understand the concept that you're doing something for, not for yourself. I just couldn't understand it. And that was one of the small trigger points that got me thinking about, you know, who I am. So that's a trigger point. Another trigger point was when my son was born, my first child, I realized two things, right? Mm. The first, th- first thing I realized was how bad son I was to my father, right? And I was, I was crying, very right? felt really guilty about the whole thing because it just awakened the reality of how egotistical you were to your own parents. The other thing was is I knew immediately when my son was born that I could easily put my neck on a rail- railway line and allow the train to decapitate me mm. just for my son. That's what you, as a parent, that's what you do. You would like, you could you could literally do anything, any means necessary to help and save your, your child. But then that made me realize, did I have the same approach for Allah? Mm. So that's why Allah says children are tests for you, but also a lesson. Yeah. And that lesson was, I wasn't where I thought I was concerning my level of Iman because, you know, I was so willing to, like, sacrifice for my son, but could I do that for Allah? Mm. So that was a waking point. Another waking point was where I attended this kind of psychology course thing, and it's designed to just teach you how much of a scumbag you are. <laughs> As most psychology um, yeah, does teach like, you. <laughs> you're for, you're a scumbag. You saw so your for, you have the power to change the relations in your life. Don't you blame don't. others, blame yourself, blame yourself. And then because there's about 200 people in the room and they all have the same experience, you see your life in them as well mm-hmm. and it becomes really real. So that was a waking up point. It made me realize like, it made me realize everything I've been doing, probably been doing for the wrong reason. And it's all ego. So after that, <clears throat> I went for a humility exercise or a set of humbling exercises like apologizing to people and blaming myself even when I didn't deserve the blame but stuff like that mm. it was a good training um, that was a waking up experience also just before I converted to Islam where I knew Islam was the truth intellectually but I wouldn't become a Muslim and I became a Muslim when my friend talked to me about death but in such a real way mm. a profound way like I internalized that information straight away. So that was a waking up point, thinking, okay, I need to make a decision because there are implications. Every day is a waking up point, really. Mm. Every day can be if you reflect on your day properly, for sure. Every day should be an awakening day for Muslim. Mm. They shouldn't just wait for like a calamity. No, of course not. I mean, because if you if you... If you adopt the art of reflection, then every day becomes a new day. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Like, I don't really remember what happened yesterday or two days ago a week. <laughs> I've trained myself like that. Mm. And even, like, I could argue with someone at home and, or, like, my mom or dad or, and it didn't happen. Mm. Like, Monday comes, it didn't happen. Like, oh, it's sh- like that. It's, like, it's almost meaningless. And I think... I'm Muslim to be successful spiritually. 
everything is meaningless unless Allah gives it meaning. I think we get a lot of problems because we give our own meaning to things. Yeah. Oh, but she said this about me. How dare she? Come down. Who the hell are you? So what? Mm. You know, her ends might be better than yours. Yeah. Right? You might have minor shirk in your heart. What's wrong with you? Relax. True. What is the meaning Allah is giving you here? Mm. Find out what Allah intends for you and find out what meaning He wants in this situation, which usually is just shut up and forgive her. Yeah. But we don't do that because we give so much meaning to it. We give so much meaning to it. So if you follow that general rule, everything is meaningless unless Allah gives it meaning, then you'd be like the Prophet of Salaam, where he would never demand his right. He would only get angry for the rights of Allah. And I believe other people, but himself, he wouldn't care. He wouldn't care. Okay. Mm, that's a very interesting perspective to put it. Um, you know something that, like, because um, I do know that when you became Muslim, one of, one of the things was you became Muslim during, like, a uni- university college age. So then after that, you know, you started, you know, taking whatever decisions in your life to, to be where you are today. Like, what advice would you give to people of that age, like, whether they be born Muslims or just became Muslims, with not, with realizing that, you know, they're really nothing and, that with realizing like their place in the world and with their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what advice would you give them on how they should go about with their life? Well, first it's about perspective. So when, when you realize you're nothing spiritually, then that should basically empower you and and make you realize that everything happens because of the will and power of Allah. So if everything happens because of Allah's will and power, then that should really make you Superman. It's weird. But you just said we shouldn't be Superman. I know. By intention. But once you realize you're nothing, yeah. and then you realize everything happens because of the will and power of Allah, that can make you Superman without intending I want to be something. Why? Just like the Sahaba. They spread a psalm all around the world in just a few years. And they were so successful because they knew that Allah was everything. Everything happens because of his power and because of his will and that we're essentially just empty tools Allah uses to manifest his guidance and his mercy. So when you when you understand everything happens because of the will and power of Allah, it creates a new realm of possibility. Like anything becomes possible because you don't know what the will of Allah is. Mm. And the minute you don't think it's possible, it's because you haven't you have given something else power. That's the point. Mm. So we think, oh no, I can't do that. Why? <clears throat> Does, did Allah tell you this? You don't know? It's because you've given something else power. You've actually built will to something else. But the only thing that really manifests itself is Allah's will. And you don't know what that will is. So there's an infinite realm of possibility to achieve what you can. And that's why Muslims should be seen as crazy people. Crazy people. <laughs> yeah, we like to use that word a lot. Yeah, <laughs> a lot. So, um... Going back to like say the tools kind of side of it, what is something that you use to like keep in touch with your crazy like side of infinite possibilities? Perspective. That's a good point. What do I do to maintain that craziness? I don't know really. I think the more you reflect on Allah, the more that craziness will come out. I guess like He is the powerful one. He's the one who gets which you brave, isn't it? If mm. Allah is with you and he you know he's your protector and you know everything happens everything happens because of him, then mm. everything is possible. Mm. So that creates that craziness. Mm. So like knowing that okay, so there are infinite amount of possibilities in the world, how does one know what direction to go to then? I mean, because you said that you know, they should go to the leadership courses and whatnot. No, I'm not saying they shouldn't go, <laughs> but I'm saying we, we live in a, it's a spiritual crisis that yeah. we need that everyone wants to become a leader. Yeah. I mean, before you become a leader, you have to be a good follower. Yes. Right? There's not one course on how to become a good follower. Oh, Isn't that an indictment to our spirituality? Yeah. And I blame some of the so-called teachers. Come on, you haven't taught them to be good followers and you're going to teach them to be leaders? Some of these guys can't even do their own shoelaces. <laughs> they can't even cook their own curries. And you're going to make them into a leader. You know, some of, some of the, they're mothered so much, you know, whether they fall over or they're upset or whatever, they're so mothered. And you're going to create these babies into leaders? I don't care what age he is. 
You know, usually they're still babies. Anyway, ran over. The point is, <laughs> what was the question? Tools that you use. Oh, actually, yeah, tools on what you use, but also how, how do you know what direction to go to? Yeah, Infinite I mean, possibilities. I'm the kind of person that says, don't plan your life. Really? Of course not. That's but a very crazy plan. plan. You plan to fail. Nah, that's rubbish. Yeah. That's rubbish. Why? Why? Because Allah's plan is always going to come into play anyway. Plan your life in pencil. Because okay. Allah will just rub it out for you. Trust me. We're mm-hmm. taking directions that you don't know. Just walk to Allah. He will hurry. Khalas. That's my humble view. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. We should have a vision for ourselves for the sake of Allah and want to do things for the sake of Allah. But I've, I follow the kind of view that, you know what? Have a very fuzzy direction. Like mm-hmm. somewhere there. It's clouded. You don't know where you're going. Mm-hmm. Allah will direct you. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, that, you know, you yeah. plan, but Allah plans. Allah's plan will always, always dominate. So, what you should really do is make dua that what Allah has planned for you is good for you. Mm. And, that, and that should be the case. And do your best. I didn't plan what I was going to be and do, but I've achieved the small things I've achieved so far. No way did I plan that. It just happens because you doing the work and you, you just now you may argue if you plan then you can achieve more mm. this is really interesting because as a student this is all that's children oh that's what I was going to say quick plan, quick, plan, quick plan. uni yeah quick, quick uni, uni. Uh, yeah. you're never going to put that that's in your podcast are you I'm going to put it in <laughs> let me tell you why you should quit, quit uni my mom's going to kill me <laughs> if you're not studying for something vocational like engineering law nursing doctor, maybe pharmacy. Mm. But if you're doing things like pharmaceutical science, biology, history, all these subjects, sociology, Mm. quit. It's a waste of money and time. That's Mm. my view. Because you're just being a sheep reacting to the fact that everyone has to get a degree. Degrees don't make you intelligent. Western education teaches you what to think, not how to think. Mm. You could learn what you learn in sociology in the three-year degree, you can learn that in at least nine months, I think, with self-learning. With self-learning, and not only self-learning, but with buying your own books, your literature, studying, making your own notes, being motivated to learn. I've seen that in my life. Mm. I didn't study philosophy or theories of the mind or whatever. Yeah. But I'm able to articulate a case with an analytical professor. Yeah. And he says, I agree with 95% of what you said. Yeah. I'm so, just giving that as an example to show that if you're motivated, you do much more learning outside of university for sure. So if it's just for the learning to become intelligent, then you it's an expensive way to do that. Quit. Mm. And it's pointless because you pick up bad habits anyway. Because mm. you need all about ego, most of it. So quit. Yeah. Save, and then what do you do? Save your soul. Buy books and read. Yeah. And do you want some, do something else? Now, especially for sisters, if you're not gonna, if you're really not gonna get a job, you need to get married, you'll take care of you. It's a waste of time. But many people put it as a tick box. I have to get the degree because it's part of my self identity. Yeah. They're just being a slave. You don't have to do that. In those three years, you could have done charity work. You could have traveled the world. You could have learned things in your own time. You could have done so many great achievements. But what do you want to do? Yeah, a degree. Mm. I've actually been in one of those dis- discussions in which, like, uh, sisters are talking about degree and everything, and they're like, "Well, I need a degree so that you know I can be a better teacher for my children." That's rubbish. <laughs> Absolutely rubbish. Do you think it's the uh, best yeah. teachers? They're the natural teachers. Yeah. And getting a degree won't make you a good teacher. Getting a degree doesn't make you empathic. It doesn't empathetic. It doesn't make you compassionate. It doesn't make you tolerant, necessarily. It just gives you information. It just teaches you to be a good consumer. Mm. I don't think getting a degree teaches you to be a good teacher. Not necessarily. So what would make you a good teacher, then? By teaching. That's the irony. By teaching? Yeah. But then you have to learn before you teach. So how do they teach you to be a teacher? They tell you to teach. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's the whole point. Is immerse you in that environment. That's the irony. To be a good speaker, someone says, how do you be a good speaker, Hamza? Speak. Mm-hmm. No matter what books you read about how to be a good speaker, yeah. it probably won't help you that much, guaranteed. Because the people who wrote those books observed the good speakers 
who did it naturally. Yeah. <laughs> so he just kicked the middleman out of the way, throw the book in the bin, and just start speaking, learn from the mistakes, get some advice, and move forward. Yeah. yeah. Just going for it and learning it. Pretty much one of, the, one of the thing is, how do you know that you should go on in this direction? See, that's what people kind of like... Um, like a lot of people, people that think, okay, then how do I make that decision? Whether I'm going to this infinite possibility, well, you or do that this. One. You just say, I want to please Allah. Okay. How can I please Allah with my current natural inclinations, disposition, and capa- and skills and, and capacity? Yeah. And it's the power of questioning. So if no one asks us that question, though, yeah, that's true. They, it's the other way around. They say, right, where do you want to be? But you're missing the point. Why do you want to be where you want to be? We don't ask that question. Like, Hamza, what do you want to do when you grow up? That's the wrong question. You should be, Hamza, what do you want to do in your life in order to please Allah and become a good Muslim? That's a different question. Mm-hmm. So if we tell our youth, right, your goal is to please Allah, how are you going to please Allah with the capacities, with the nature, with the inclinations and skills that you have at the moment? You're like, you know what, I really, really like helping others. Boom, just do it. Find yourself. Others are like, I've got a big mouth. I really could talk or talk, right? Yalla, speak. And that's it. But you have to ask yourself the right questions. And we seldom follow the Quranic strategy of the power of questioning. We don't. And Allah teaches us questions all the time, gives us questions. But we don't. We just keep on looking at the goal, which is a problem. And that's where we end up. Tell them that that's why we're not happy. Because we say, oh, I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve. But your goal was pleasing Allah, not the, not the, not the outcome. Mm. So if you write, ask yourself the right question, then you end up in the right place, I think, hopefully, yeah. inshallah. Yeah, because I've seen it like um, like when some people do create goals, they become so attached to it that like even after they like they achieve that goal, they find themselves depressed Yes. because their, their end was to get that goal. It wasn't like mm. to kind of, I guess like it comes back to asking the right question. And that's actually very simple but very profound mm. to, make, to make decisions, ask yes. the right questions. Yes. Do you think the the kind of like mayhem that we're in right now, the social weather, you know, like neg- negativity and things like that, is it because like we don't ask the right questions or we're not people of thought? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. The amount of questions I get from Muslims, and without being sounding arrogant, I'm like, what a stupid person <laughs> has this. Per- well, like some of these brothers and sisters, they think so much to get the best mortgage or the best car. They study, analyze. But when it comes to the deen of Allah, they don't even bother to switch their brain on. Mm. Honestly, it's like the mouth is on first and the brain is dead, mm. right? And I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe I should answer the question. Maybe I should teach them how to think. It's sad. It's sad because and we see this in our lives. Get a good mobile phone contract. If you get a good house, even when you only get a good husband or wife, anything. You put so much thought and thinking into it. But when it comes to the Dean, it's like, it's, I, th- I don't get it. Yeah. Our motivations are quite twisted. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's to do with our bringing in the commercial environment, the bling bling. Yeah. L'Oreal because I'm worth it culture. So. <laughs> You're worth it. Yeah. So how do you think? How do I think? No, like how does a person think? Yeah, no, how, how, how do you think as well? About? No, like you say that people should, um, we should be a people of thought. How do you become a person of thought? Like, what's going on in your mind right now? You're looking out, like, how do you analyze this without being like, oh my God, the world's yeah. yeah. I think thinking is a conscious decision. Mm. And then it becomes a habit. So you need to take a snapshot, snapshot of yourself and saying, to say, right, let me think about this. You know when you ask questions and some of you answer straight away, I think that's naive sometimes, because you need to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we need to teach people just to be conscious and saying, right, let me think about this, which, again, the power of questioning, what are its implications? If I can't answer the question, does it really mean anything? Is this the right question? What do I mean by this? Or what does it mean, etc.? So ask the right questions about a particular thing. And, um, yeah, like for example, take the whole atheist narrative. Some atheists say, if God was eternal and before creation there was nothing but Him, 
what was he doing? Mm. And I'm like, he was doing what he was doing. <laughs> and I, I always ask the question, you know, if I can't answer that question, does that undermine God's existence? Sure. No. So is it really a valid question? Mm. Not really. Mm. If I said she was in the other room last week, you not knowing what I was doing, does it mean I wasn't in that room last week? Mm. So you just get to be able to think, to so get that question and apply it and extend it and, 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 you know, manipulate it and try and apply the different scenarios and the logic or the basis, the assumption behind the question. Seek the assumption. Because mm. I know, Muslims get, you know, we Muslims we get so overwhelmed by things, thinking that, oh my God, you know, how does this affect my religion? You know, the amount of questions I got on the Higgs boson, this particle that they found, that makes up the Higgs field. The Higgs field was this field that was switched on in the early universe and it gave particles mass. They're like, oh my God, God doesn't exist anymore because they found the particle. It was called the God particle. But the reason it called the God particle because before it was called the God damn particle because they couldn't find it. Yeah. It had nothing to do with God. And I like to say to people, look, they found a particle. How does that undermine anything? Think about your question. Think about the reality at hand. Mm. What is the implications of this? And when you give people the power of questions, they get them to think in different ways. Mm. And it's a habit when you get used to it. Yeah. And to think you need to uh, put aside the time there. Because we're, I mean, then. No, to think you just need to switch off the TV, switch off Facebook, Twitter, eating too much. We always go out too much to mm. eat. Unnecessary social gatherings, bickering, gossip, and just think. Cool. So going on like a completely new tangent. This currently, is a long podcast, by the way. Oh, it's really long. Yes. That's good. Yeah, we're going to be wrapping up shortly. So yeah, um, currently the social weather in Australia is quite negative towards Muslims in general, and some people, um, like even like our own relatives, they're like scared to go out because of like the possible hate. How? How can we come to terms with this hate and progress and kind of like sow the seeds of change in a society that could possibly not want the seeds of change? That's a good question. I think we shouldn't preframe people. The minute you preframe, if you preframe someone, even if it's a non-Muslim, then your whole relationship with them is going to be via the lenses that you created. Hate, fear, whatever the case may be. So you're preframing them. Don't preframe them. And we sh- we saw this to be the case. There was a brother who did this Islamophobia study or test mm. in public, and he found that the majority of the Australian public were very kind and would stick up for brothers and sisters when there was racist or Islamophobic abuse. Yeah. So there's no need to preframe people. That's the number one point. Don't preframe. And then when you do that, it's a blank canvas. So you can engage with them in a new realm, with a, in a new realm of possibility with that person. So don't preframe. Secondly, do what you have to do. Yeah. Ignore the circumstances. Because the minute you, you, you're focused too much on the circumstances, you're a slave to circumstance. Mm-hmm. Sahaba weren't like that. Because they knew everything happened because of the word and power of Allah. So you got the circumstance, right? I, what are you going to do? If you stay at home, there's still going to be hate. If you go outside, there's still going to be hate. Yeah. So the point is, just do. it's counted out. So hate's everywhere. So the point is, you still need to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So whatever, you know, it makes a difference. Deal with it. You yeah. know? Um, and you can deal with it by being positive role models. Mm. So um, just our final question, I just want to um, ask you back on what you said about uh, planning. So um, how do you go about planning your day then? I mean, is it just like you wake up and you're like, I'm going to fly off to Sydney and do a course? Which no, very obviously not. Obviously yeah. not. Someone invites you, you free in your diary, you put in your diary and you go. But in terms of planning the day, don't get me wrong, we do plan the week. Yeah. yeah? Now in terms of what are the kind of actions I have to do. But it becomes such a natural thing that you're doing it naturally. You're not really... And, and what I meant was the difference between planning your actions and planning your life. Yeah. That's what I meant. I think over planning your life is lack of talk and lack of reliance on Allah. Yeah. Because He's already planned it for you anyway. So whatever, whatever you do, you know, Allah will take you places. So I think rely on Allah more than your plan. That's my point. Mm. And that's what just plan in pencil. 
Yeah. But in terms of actions and work, obviously plan your week, plan your day, put in yeah. your diary. But I meant, you know, the whole planning for the vision of your life and, yeah. the, and the big milestones in your life and all of these things. A lot of ticket places that you don't know. He's got things planned for you that you have no idea about. And he will take you places. Just be sincere. Do the action. Allah does the rest. Mm. The point is, we plan. We we assume the role of Allah. And we want Allah to be sincere about us. But we need to be sincere. And we need Allah to do the job. Right? Yeah. Just to let his plan manifest itself. So be sincere and do the action. Mm. But what we do is, we plan, which is really Allah's job ultimately. Yeah. And we want Allah to do the action for us. And we want Allah to be sincere for us. You see my point? It's a role reversal. Yeah. Which is a spiritual disease again. Confusion. Yeah, just have a quasi-plan, but be sincere to the action. Allah would change it, make it better, add to it, take you places that you would have never imagined. I would never have realized. If you told me 10 years ago, I'd be in Australia, Malaysia, America, many parts of America, Canada, South Africa, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, I mean, so many different places, Dubai, Qatar, mm. Saudi, I would have said, no way, possible. Yeah. yeah. I would have said, you're having a laugh. Yeah. So, Bala took me there. So... You think if I yeah. planned it, I would have went? Probably not. Yeah, probably not, because you, I, I, I guess what one person would think now, like, they can't imagine themselves doing it. So... Pretty much when it comes to like your day to day, like your your day, your week, you plan it in so that you know you can get things done and be organized. But yeah, I have very short term plans. That's yeah, my point. short term plans. So one week, two week, maximum maybe a month. Yeah. Hardly never more than a month. Yeah, but just generally for life, you pencil in it and then you're just open to possibilities pretty much. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because plan is, planning is what you call an iterative process. You mm. never, you're not supposed to follow the plan. It's iterative, it changes as you, the more action you do, the more you realize, oh, well, actually, I should be doing this. So plan is an iterative process. It can change, it can amend. It's just a mechanism to help you achieve what you want to achieve. Mm. Fantastic. That's well, a good balance. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, Hamza. Um, our listeners will definitely, inshallah, benefit from this and more planning, more short term. Yeah, yeah. So thanks again. Thank right. you so much. Right. Again. All right. So that concludes the interview with Hamza Sources. Inshallah, you benefited from that and enjoyed the conversation that we had with him. I know uh, Mifra and I really enjoyed it immensely and we learned a lot. And for more interviews like this one um, and access to our past and future episodes, make sure to get our mobile podcast app. You can get access to all the episodes and it automatically ups- updates with the latest episodes that we have. Plus there's some cool features like you can download um, episodes and listen to them later without having to stream them. And you can email the show straight from the app. So make sure you get it from your local Apple Windows or Android app store today. And to keep up with the latest at Muslim Life Hackers and get access to exclusive content and previews to future Muslim Life Hackers projects, make sure to join our mailing list. You get access to all that, plus hear some crazy stories and tips and tricks from Mifra and I that we share with our mailing list. So make sure you sign up now. Just go to MuslimLifeHackers.com forward slash newsletter. All right, guys, that's all for today. Until next time, aim high, take action, and be awesome. But first, we 